the last lecture we saw how the energy of an electron in an applied magnetic field consists of magnetic terms of different kinds. One is a paramagnetic term and the other is a diamagnetic term. Paramagnetic term corresponds to a positive magnetic susceptibility in the sense that the magnetic dipoles are aligned along the applied magnetic field. Whereas, the diamagnetic term arises from a negative magnetic susceptibility and this is due to the extra centrifugal term centrifugal force. due to the magnetic field on the electron in an atomic or molecular orbital. So, this causes the magnetic flux associated with the field to change changes and this induces inducing an EMF according to Lenz's law in electromagnetism. So, this is since this EMF is a back EMF which is opposing the influence of the field and therefore, it has a negative sign that gives you the negative diamagnetic susceptibility. This effect is universal the diamagnetism occurs in all substances whereas, paramagnetism occurs only in cases where there is an unpaired electron giving rise to a net magnetic dipole moment which has to orient along the field. So, this does not occur in all situations whereas, diamagnetism always occurs. The total diamagnetic susceptibility is obtained by summing up the contributions from all the electrons total is sum of contributions. from all electrons and then in all atoms or molecules in a given quantity of the material. So, the magnetization is then chi diamagnetic types 
H or B, where B is the in magnetic induction. So, if you have n atoms, each with z electrons, because the atom with an atomic number z will have z electrons, then the m is n z times the contribution which is minus e square b by 6 m times as we saw last time. So, where r square is the average value of the square of the atomic radius orbital radius. So, thus we get chi chi r as minus n z e square by 6 m times r square. So, n is of course, the Avogadro number if we are talking about the molar diamagnetic susceptibility and this is of the order of 10 to the power minus 8 in most substances. Therefore, it is an extremely small value per mole. So, this is an ex even though it is present everywhere in all the materials, this is extremely small in comparison to the contributions from paramagnetism or ferromagnetism. Therefore, we usually do not feel it, we do not talk about it, but in general for accurate work you have to take account of the diamagnetism before determining calculating the paramagnetic or ferromagnetic contributions. Next we consider paramagnetism. As we said, it is necessary to have an unpaired electron in the atom or molecule in order to give rise to a net orbital angular momentum non zero orbital or spin angular momentum. Only when there is a non zero net orbital and or spin angular momentum, then only you will have a net dipole magnetic dipole moment which gives rise to a paramagnetic effect. So, what kinds of systems are they which have such a possibility? Which are the systems in which the there is a non zero orbital or spin angular momentum? given right giving right uh, given by unpaired electron spins. So, this is the question. So, why if we look at the periodic table of elements we find the so called transition metal ions corresponding to the filling of 3 D shells or even 4 D shells and so on or rare earth ions corresponding to the 4 F shell. So, these are the ions, this 3 D ions are also known as the iron group ions because the iron F e 2 plus or F e 3 plus is an important member of this group. So, are the other magnetic ferromagnetic ions such as cobalt, 
nickel and so on sorry nickel 2 plus nickel 3 plus nickel plus also. So, these are the various ions and the rare earth ions are known as the lanthanides. So, they correspond to the progressive filling of the 4 f shell and they are the most prominent examples of paramagnetic behavior. So, the next table summarizes this with the giving the magnetic moment in Bohr magnetons both experimental and calculated values for the different typical members of the ion, ion group 3 D transition metal ion as well as the lanthanide rare earth ions. In order to understand this paramagnetic behavior, it is necessary for us to consider the spectroscopic notation of the ground state of an ion. How do you determine the ground state? And that is what will determine the corresponding paramagnetic moment. For example, let us consider a particularly simple example of manganese 2 plus and similarly for the lanthanide group let us take gadolinium 3 plus. So, if you consider the manganese ion from the atomic number of manganese, we can easily find that this corresponds to a configuration, the electron configuration with an outermost shell in which there are 5 unpaired electrons in the outermost 3 D shell. A typical example of this is manganese oxide MnO, where manganese occurs in the 2 plus state. So, the, there are 5 electrons in the unfilled 3 D shell, the outer 2 4 s 2 are ionized in M n 2 plus. So, these go out leaving these in the unfilled outermost shell it is the behavior of these 5 electrons that determines the magnetic behavior of a manganese ion. In general the 3 D shell can have 10 electrons. So, this is a half filled shell. So, according to Hund's rule all the electrons will be found in such states so as to have the maximum Hund's rule gives you maximum orbital angular momentum. So as not to violate the Pauli principle consistent with the Pauli exclusion principle. We have already seen what is Pauli exclusion principle. According to Pauli exclusion principle, no two electrons having all quantum numbers identical can occupy the same quantum state. In other words, applied to the manganese plus for which there are different states since there are 5 electrons and this is a d shell. So, you have the possibility plus 2 plus 1 0 minus 1 and minus 2. So, this gives me these are the various ml 
values for the orbital angular momentum which are possible. So, all these are filled by electron since there are 5 states each of these is filled so as so that the total orbital angular momentum because if they are if another electron is put into this it can have only spin down. So, we must have L equal to the total the sum of these is 0. So, that you can have maximum spin multiplicity in other words we want to have spin orientation this upward arrow corresponds to m s equal to plus half these are the m l and these are the m s. So, I have s equal to phi by 2. So, I have maximum spin and consistent with that I have l equal to 0 which is a s state l equal to 0 corresponds to an s state and uh, the j the total angular momentum which is l plus s is phi by 2. So, the ground multiplet has j equal to phi by 2. So, if you look at the ground state this is be the ground state for the m n 2 plus ion. Now, in the same way we can find that gadolinium 3 plus which has a 4 f 7 configuration in the outer shell outermost unfilled shell. So, since there is a possibility of 14 electrons in the f shell therefore, we again have a half filled shell and similarly, we can have m l equal to plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 0 minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 giving l equal to 0 and m s is up spin up spin up spin up spin up spin up spin giving rise to s equal to 7 by 2. So, we have an s state again with a j equal to l equal to 0. So, j is 7 by 2. So, that would be the spectroscopic state of the gadolinium 3 plus ion. Now, having determined the ground state of the ion, we can we have to now proceed to find the g factor of this ion. It is this g factor which will determine the magnetic moment. So, in the case of the gadolinium 3 plus, the situation is somewhat simpler because in order to determine this we have to proceed by considering the Hamiltonian of the electron a many electron atom which is which has the following terms. This is the kinetic energy term P i square by 2 m summed over all the different electrons which are labeled by the denoted by this label i. Then you have I am leaving out the 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught etcetera. So, that I have this is the kinetic energy term, this is the potential energy term. I have also this is the potential energy in the nuclear nuclear field coulomb field of the nucleus. 
so this is minus and then I have plus sigma i less than j. This is the inter electron coupling or repulsion. So, beyond this we have the various terms, the most important is the spin orbit coupling. which has the form lambda L dot s. So, if the spin orbit coupling is sufficiently strong, I am writing it in descending order of the strength of the various interactions. So, if this coupling is strong, this gives the coupling between L and s gives you a resultant j as the total angular momentum. So, that it is this angular momentum which interacts with an applied magnetic field, Zeeman term. Due to a magnetic field, so in order to find this, we have the Huns rules, we have applied the Huns rules and now we can proceed to find the G factor. So, how do we go about doing this? We have in according to the G j, G j is the G factor associated with the total angular momentum j, which is given by G L into L cos L j plus G s into s cos s j. So, this is the projection of the contribution from the orbital angular momentum, this is the contribution from the spin angular momentum. Now, G j is given by 1 plus or L square plus J square minus 2 S square minus S square times plus 2 into S square plus J square minus L square. This 2 comes because the Lande G factor for spin which we write as G s is approximately 2. So, if you take these two together you get the net j as 3 j into j plus 1 minus L into L plus 1 plus S into S plus 1 by 2 j into j plus 1. That is the expression for the g factor associated with an angular momentum j. Here for every square of the angular momentum operator, we have replaced it by the corresponding eigenvalue which is j into j plus 1 for j square, l into l plus 1 for l square s into s plus 1 for l square. So, using this since we know the l s and j we can calculate the g value. If we substitute these values we get a g value of 7.94 for the gadolinium. Now, G j G j into j into j plus 1, which is the angular momentum, which is 7.94 Bohr magnetons. So, this is how we calculate the magnetic moment 
of a given paramagnetic ion. Now, how do we experimentally determine it? We experimentally determine it by measuring the magnetization in an applied magnetic field. So, that d m by d b gives you the chi m. The paramagnetic susceptibility is given by d m by d b, where the magnetization is n mu, where mu is the average of the magnetic moments, individual magnetic moment and n is the number of ions. If it is a mole of the substance, this number is the Avogadro number. The average magnetic moment has now to be calculated in order to make a theoretical calculation of the magnetic susceptibility and then we can compare with the experimentally determined values. In order to do this, we have to compare this by recalling our discussion of the orientational polarization in the case of a dielectric material, a paraelectric material, where you have a number of electric dipoles distributed in different orientations in an applied electric field. This was classically treated by using Boltzmann statistics. The various orientations of the electric dipole with respect to the applied electric field ranges from 0 to pi, the angle theta goes from 0 to pi, all these orientations were allowed. The main difference, the, our argument in this case proceeds in the same way. We will calculate the statistical average of the dipole moment of the paramagnetic ion by averaging it over all the allowed orientations in the case of a paramagnetic dipole. The only thing is in the magnetic case, we have spatial quantization, which means that all orientations are not allowed corresponding to theta equal to 0 to pi are not allowed. Only certain discrete orientations are allowed. For example, in the case of a spin half, you have m s equal to plus minus half. These are usually denoted by an up or down arrow. That means, the dipole is either aligned parallel to the applied magnetic field or it is aligned anti parallel to the applied so, you have only two such orientations possible for a spin half. The spin can only be half integral in general or integral corresponding to a given s value m s has 2 s plus 1 value possible values. And these 2 s plus 1 orientations will have different energies in the applied magnetic field and we make a statistical average of the magnetic moment over these 2 s plus orient 1 orientation from for example, plus for example, if you have m j then this goes from minus j to plus j which is 2 j plus 1. So, this is what we have to do in order to calculate the average moment. So, let us calculate this now. So, the average moment mu is a sum statistical sum over g j mu b b exponential well, this can be written as m j, because you have mu b, b dot j. So, that gives you m j exponential g j mu b 
m j b by k b t by sigma over m j equal to minus j to plus j divided by So, that gives you the net average magnetic moment. For shorthand, let us write g j mu b m j by k b t b as x just for shorthand. So, that we can write this and doing the calculation, it turns out that we arrive at g j mu b b j of x times j. So, this is the average where this b j of x is known as the Brillouin function. The explicit form of this Brillouin function is as follows. What is the below in function associated with a given j value b j of x is 2 j plus 1 by 2 j cot h of 2 j plus 1 x by 2 minus plus 1 by 2 j cot h of x by 2. So, this is minus. So, this is the form of the Brillouin function. It is rather easy to make the substitution and arrive at this form. So, this is the form of the Brillouin function which enters the expression of the magnetic moment. So, for a given j value and a given b value and so on, m can be written which is n mu can be written as m naught b j of x, where m naught is a saturation value, the maximum value, maximum possible value, when all the n spins are aligned parallel to the applied magnetic. So, we can show the experiment graphically show the variation of the m j associated with a given j value for different choices of different magnetic moments. So, the overall variation has a form like this m versus b goes like this. So, that is m naught. So, this is the b j of x, b j of x where x is g j mu b b by k b t. So, we can see several features all the v a given magnetization always approaches a saturation. So, this is the phenomenon of paramagnetic saturation it approaches a constant value at high enough field. So, once you have the field which is sufficiently strong that all the dipoles get lined up along the field then you cannot increase the magnetic moment beyond that value. So, that is why you reach maximum value and close to the origin this is linear and then it slowly becomes non-linear and tends to this uh, saturation value which is determined by this overall behavior is determined by this argument of the Brillouin function which basically involves the applied strength of the applied field and the temperature. So, either 
you can have a very high magnetic field or you can go to a very low temperature. In both cases, the value of x is very high. So, that will give you the saturation. So, that is the overall behavior you have. So, all the graphs can be shown to be linear close to the origin. This is the region corresponding to small applied magnetic field and high temperatures. This is where the susceptibility can be defined as the ratio of the magnetization to the strength of the applied magnetic field. So, in the limit when x tends to 0 very close to the origin we can show that B j of x tends to the value j into j plus 1 by 3. j plus 1 into x by 3. So, the slope of this is just j plus 1 by 3. So, the chi m, the magnetic susceptibility which is defined as the ratio of the magnetization to the applied field becomes in the linear region. So, this gives me a susceptibility, paramagnetic susceptibility, which is inversely proportional to the absolute temperature. So, the effective magnetic moment is given by n mu effective square by 3 k d t. So, this is g j square j into j plus 1 mu b square and that is mu effective is therefore, g j root j into j plus 1 Bohr magnetons. So, we can calculate the effective magnetic moment once you know the g j the g factor and the j value. So, this can be calculated as we have already seen in the case of the gadolinium 3 plus ion. So, this is the in this form this orientation this susceptibility the paramagnetic susceptibility resembles the dielectric orientational susceptibility in the case of a polar molecule. For sufficiently high fields and or low temperatures, when the spin alignment in the field is complete, we can easily see that limit extending to infinity B j of x is 1. So, that m will become m naught the saturation value. So, the chi at low temperatures goes as C by T, where C is a constant known as Curie constant. It has the value n mu effective square by 3 k B. So, if you substitute all these values, this is 0. Point 1241 into p effective square, where p effective is the effective uh, Bohr magneton number, which we calculated as 7.94 in the case of gadolinium 3 plus. So, we have in general a diamagnetic and a paramagnetic susceptibility. So, the next figure shows both these contributions the magnetic susceptibility 
which always includes a diamagnetic contribution and in the case of a system with unpaired magnetic ions, unpaired electrons, it also has a paramagnetic contribution and the paramagnetic contribution is positive and goes as susceptibility this is 0. So, the paramagnetic contribution goes like this corresponding to this C by T variation, this is paramagnetic and there is a small negative diamagnetic. The total susceptibility is the sum of these two as a function of temperature. This is the inverse 1 by T which gives you a hyperbolic dependence. For example, if you take chi inverse it is T by C. So, if you plot the inverse susceptibility 1 by chi as a function of the absolute temperature, you will get a straight line whose slope is 1 by C from which you can determine the effective magneton number. So, this is how we compare calculate the theoretical value and compare it with experimentally measured susceptibility values. So, this comparison is shown in, in a table, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the table. You can see that most of the rarer ions, the comparison between the experimental and calculated values is quite satisfactory, whereas this is not the case with the iron group ions there is a fundamental reason for that. But before going to that, let us consider the rare earth ions. In the case of europium 3 plus and samarium 3 plus, the agreement is poor as you can see from the table. This is because this was accounted for by Van Vleck. The reason for this departure, this disagreement between the experimental and calculated value in the case of europium and samarium is because these two ions have not only ground multiplets, but an excited multiplet close to the ground multiplet. So, you have a ground multiplet with an excited multiplet. And our assumption has been that at sufficiently low temperature, all the ions are practically in the ground state and there is the excited state is sufficiently far away that there is no admixture of the excited and uh, state into the ground state. Otherwise, the excited has state will have a different magnetic moment. If there is an admixture, this will also mix with this ground state magnetic moment. And this is precisely what happens in these cases of europium and samarium. And because of this admixture of the excited state into the ground state, because of the relatively short, small separation between the ground state and excited state. So, this can mix with this, that is what changes the magnetic moment value. That contributes to what is known as Van Vleck paramagnetism. which is temperature independent, unlike the Curie paramagnetism which is dependent inversely on the temperature, it depends on 1 by T. Well, we have to consider the iron group ions, where we know that the agreement between the experimental and calculated values in this following this procedure is rather poor and there is a very deep fundamental reason for this which has to do with the nature of the 3 D ions in comparison to the 4 F ions. You will see this in the next lecture.